All right. So content AI systems, like I said, I'm going to try to keep it to the, the ideas that are most important, but I kind of think that we need to bucket out the conversation today into two sections. The first of which is like, what are the underlying technologies, right? So I use the illustration of like, my husband's dad is an engineer and his granddad was an engineer and they can understand technology better than like anyone you've ever met because they understand the basic principles behind how physical phenomena occur, right? So having like these very fundamental building blocks, the, the problem with emerging technologies like this is it, it collects a lot of acronyms and it collects a lot of like basic like group think. And so we all think that we either understand it, no question, or we don't get it at all because it's really complex. Um, neither of those things are, is true, right? Like all of these concepts are very accessible. None of this is rocket science, but breaking it down and understanding the simplest parts of how something like this functions is what enables you to really understand then a lot further into its maturity as a technology and use cases and all of that in the real world. Um, you, you can get it, like you can crack the code of understanding, like, how do we use these things? Because regardless of whether or not I think these things are good or bad, right? Like we won't assign a moral value to technology. It is what it is used for. Um, it's, it's here. And as we began this conversation, like everybody's using it. Uh, like you said, Alicia, like it's the fastest downloaded app. I mean, there is no denying the fact that these technologies have become mainstream very fast and they took a long time to build but then they got mainstream very fast and not a lot of people know how to use them <laughs> so let's let's like peel back the layers of all the things that we think we know about it and consider um how we can how these actually function and then how we actually can be how they can be useful or not and where the deficiencies are because at the very minimum all of us are going to be asked about them if we haven't already and we're going to have to figure out what our answer is, right? What our stance is. Um, yeah. So today we're specifically talking about content AI as far as SEO goes, but I think we have to be more basic than that to begin the conversation so that we understand the foundational technologies and principles behind it. As you probably know, and I'll just say it again, like I spent like almost a year training a content AI algorithm many years ago with a, a company from Japan. And so I reviewed hundreds of thousands of articles that, and pieces of co content and things that the algorithm had created. And I'm actually going to share some of my notes from that. Um, so you can kind of see like what I saw and what I kind of commented back as far as rules and principles and things like that. So that's kind of what we'll do today. So I'm thinking we'll start with um, just some of the very like actual content. Um, I mean, some of the actual technology, and then we can kind of go into why. Um, First acronym you need to know if you are investigating content AI at all is LLM, large language models. Okay. Large language models is not actually the technology. It's the modeling. Okay. The modeling methodology that is used. So you could conceivably look at like an LLM that's, that's a product as a natural language interface, but we'll talk about that in a second. So basically break it down large, meaning a lot language communication and a model, right? A model is a system, an organized programmatic system of how something works. Historically, when AI was being developed, artificial intelligence, it was input, input, input was what created value or quality or not. Okay. So the argument that AI is only as good as its source material is valid, but insufficient because the technology is developing and Sanders, it's kind of like a little bit, if you can kind of think of it in terms of like neural networking and some of those advanced versions of true AI. Okay. I think we've written about that before. Um, it's beginning to grow to a point where there are algorithms that can be just plugged in. Like nobody's having to build it from scratch anymore. Okay. So does that make sense? So like before we, they had to build it from scratch. So they were like, okay, zero sum, like let's all the content, all the things, putting it into the system, building rules around it. Now all that exists. So everybody's building on work. Okay. 
now and the futuristic capabilities of some of these LLMs is that there's going to be either few shot models, which means very minimal input or zero shot models, which means basically no input. It needs nothing in order to function like day one voice AI. It can take your fast food order. Okay. That's what we're heading towards is there are, and there already are systems exactly like that, that can do that. Um, so you can imagine the complexity. Okay. Because you're talking voice AI and content AI voice AI is a subset of content AI, obviously, because content is not just written. Um, but all of these systems and the LLMs function in similar ways. So the more it can be contextual, the more it can be referential, um, the better it's going to be, the more natural it's going to feel. Because when you and I have a conversation, you'll reference something that you said three sentences ago. I'll change the subject and you'll pull me back. Things happen like that, right? That are not linear in human conversation. And that's been the biggest task of AI is to figure out how, how to accommodate or mimic that branching in conversation. Okay. So that's what makes it feel like less like a chat bot and more like an actual human on the other side. So it's not just input response. Okay. There's a, a kind of a back and forth happening and there's a lot of contingencies and branching off. Okay. So LLMs, that's where they were. That's where they came from. That's where they're basically evolving to. Um, there's references in here. I actually put this on our blog. Um, so you can go look at it there if you want to, but um, Two pieces of tech. All right. So basically what you need to understand is algorithms and um, NLP. So algorithms, all it is, is an equation. Right? It's a it's a computing mechanism. So you put something in, something comes out. It's all an algorithm. It's like, there's all this like mystery around algorithms, especially like the Google algorithm. But the reality is at its very like most basic level, it's just, it's just computing information. Okay. That's all it's doing. The biggest challenge, um, the biggest shortcoming, okay, of an algorithm is that it has to have rules in order to function, okay, obviously. The biggest um, benefit of it is that you can train it using rules, okay? But unlike a human with cognition, it can't break the rules, or it can, but not in an absolute sense, okay? So... For instance, okay, one of the, and this is one of my notes from um, from my time doing the training. Oh gosh, that's too big. Okay, hold on, let me go back a little. Um, for instance, okay, when I was training the content algorithm, we dealt with hyphenation a lot. Hyphenation can be very subjective. So creating a rule around hyphenation is problematic because what you want to teach an algorithm is not do this every time. It's here's the principle, right? Here's like, the grammatical principle of when you should or shouldn't do such a thing. The problem is more than one thing is technically correct in written language. So you can't teach it an absolute rule because multiple things can be correct. And as we'll talk about in a minute, like you're going to hear the term generative AI and you need to call foul when you do. Because AI is not generating anything, right? Yet. It will, but it's not yet. Very limited, okay? True AI, maybe. But generative AI is a term you're going to hear a ton when you get into this world and Google stuff and whatever. And like, eh, I call foul on that. Point being, it can't make critical decisions. It can't be faced with two options and then be like, this is the better, this is the superior option, okay? Because there's no... You can't teach it the mathematical favorability for every possible scenario. And all it's doing is computing. So all it's doing is making favorability kind of decisions, right? This or that, which is better. Okay. So there's a shortfall there. And it's really important to understand that because as you get into um, people using content AI more, you're going to be evaluating content that it's created and you're going to be like, well, that's wrong. And so the actual argument isn't that what it's outputting is wrong. It's that it can't be taught what's right. That's just a, sh it just can't. Like it, it can't be faced with two decisions of equal value and make a decision that fits best based on how something feels, right? Which is what we do all the time, every second of every day, right? We look at two things that are equal and say, I like that one better. I don't know why, I just do, right? It just feels better. That's not obviously something that, an algorithm or anything that lacks metacognition is capable of doing. 
Okay. So that's problematic. Um, so it can't break the rules in an absolute sense. Um, these are some other ones. So for instance, like there would be these patterns that would pop up um, where text would be repeated in different places. Um, there's a lot of randomness in AI because there's a lot of um, randomness in the way people write. OK, so one of the early models that people were trying was to basically take and let the input material like the source code create rules for the algorithm, which is a learning model. Right. That's how most algorithms function, like the input reinforms the output. Um, but that was hugely problematic because people are terrible writers. And so there would just be like garbage that it was like feeding into the system and then all the stuff that it was putting out we were like oh my gosh and then when we looked back we could see the source material that it was drawing from and we're like this doesn't even look like English words like it wasn't clear at all um so there are still inconsistencies because regardless of the fact that like so even if you set and and so all the algorithms were basically then built from scratch okay best practices here are all the rules you follow however they can't be limited to what you can teach them because you could spend 85,000 years trying to teach it all the nuances of human communication. The timeline for that is not practical. So at some point, no matter how manual the process was for building it, it had to have input. Okay. And that's when it starts to become problematic because you can't teach it to evaluate every possible scenario and make the decision that a good writer would make. So there's some shortcomings there. Um, yeah, and then identifiable patterns. So the the inability, and we'll talk about this in a second, like to evaluate like uh, an entire, hey Ross, an entire piece of content is really tricky. So when we go, like we outline, right? We have a logical flow. We have a narrative flow. We have all these things. Um, it can do that in a very limited sense. Okay. Based on, so like, for instance, Chris, uh, my husband went in, he's making like a comic book and he asked the, he asked chat GPT for like a narrative of a young boy in a dystopian environment, having to ninja fight his way to a grocery store. Okay. Like very detailed. Right. And then it did it. And then he asked it to write it again, but make the situ situation more threatening. And it gave him the exact same thing. Like it didn't change. And like, it, it just, it can't capture the nuances. It can just do the form. And the story, I mean, it made sense. There was dialogue, there was a resolution, there was a kind of not really character development, but a little bit, right? So like there's there's pieces of good literature or good writing that are, are showing up, but it's a formula. So yeah, a third grader could do it. You know, it's, it's, it's just not a sophisticated kind of being able to take it all and put it together. Okay, so the big takeaways from that are just algorithms are not unbreakable or infallible, okay? They're just computing, and they can and do make mistakes. Um, and the second is they choose a ruler pattern to follow, sometimes at random, okay? It's especially salient because competing rules exist in our languages, right? Sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that, and it's really hard for it to make um, decisions. Okay, any questions about algorithms or that? I know this is a talk heavy one. Sorry. I'm just gonna like download it and then we'll talk about it. All right. NLP. If you've done SEO for any length of time, you know NLP is huge. When we did our surfer SEO training, I was talking about how natural language processing is a huge driver for how content is scored in search. Okay. So the linguistic relationships, okay, have everything to do with how Google indexes content and information. So remember again like this isn't magic. It's a it's a computing mechanism that's taking a set of words and it's vast but it's finite. That's what you have to remember. Like yes, we're talking like petabytes I think or something. Like it's a totally unfamiliar level of information to me because of how vast it is. And yet it's finite. Okay? So there's a finite amount of information, a computing mechanism and it's just filtering all it's doing is filtering and organizing. And the mechanisms by which it filters and organizes language are related to NLP. Okay, so the process of filtering is natural language processing. And basically it's the interplay between man and machine. So it's the ability of a computer process human language. Um, and it's fundamental to any AI. 
So it's very much basically how any of the content AI tools work. Okay. And then obviously, so we've got computing mechanism, we've got organizing. Okay. And then we have to have a way to make the two, to make it make sense, right? We have to have a way for us to be able to influence it. So these, that dynamic, if you just take that raw dynamic in technology, a computing mechanism and content has existed since the inception of computing machines. There's nothing novel about that. That is literally what computers do, right? They take information and organize it. Creating natural language interfaces was the actual breakthrough. So creating a way for us to not have to say 001, 001, right? Like for us to not have to know code, for us to not have to like, creating a way for anybody, democratization, to access these systems was the real breakthrough. Like that's actually the real technological revolution. And you talk to him every day, right? So Alexa, Siri, Google Assistant, all of these, right? So that's an example of an NLI. You communicate using your words and the commuter organizes it based on all the words it knows, right? And spits out an answer to you. Obviously it has flaws, right? Sometimes we talk ambiguously. We talk unpredictably. Uh, the way we word things doesn't make sense, right? We don't put the right words next to each other. But most of us have already started an education for how to use these machines because we have these tools in our homes or on our phones right? Where we've already learned. And you, you know, you can like, if you think back to the first time you ever tried to use voice command for Google to now, like, you know, how to word stuff, you know, how to like change the wording of something to get an answer faster or to get a more precise answer. All of us have learned that. And we've just simply learned it by using it, which is exactly the way that you'll learn how to use content AI tools, because there are endless numbers of commands that you can issue it and those directives are, instead of being based on code, are based on language. So if you know language and you're really good at saying things in a clear and concise way, you already have a huge advantage over everybody who's just trying to use content AI tools for the first time, right? Because your ability to command and direct is going to be huge. And I really think you all have to learn it. I don't, I don't think any of us have a choice. Like, I think we have to learn how to use these tools in a strong way. Um, okay. Any questions about algorithms, NLP, NLA? Is any of this like, no... see, yeah, go ahead. Do you see any level of difference between different algorithms, right? Obviously there's tons of these tools. Are any like particularly good, particularly bad, mm -hmm. like, Everyone talks about chat GPT, but you know, there's a ton out there. Yeah. I don't think chat GPT is particularly sophisticated. Um, I think what they did well was create the, the, it can cover more categories of content or more stylized content. That's the only feature in their algorithm that I would say is even remotely unique. Almost everybody is using the same a slight variation on the same original content algorithm. Like it was built and it took many, many years to build it. And everybody basically copy pasted it and then built a little bit of technology on top of it to customize it. That's it. So I, I don't, I think it's as good as the user. Yeah. Any other questions about I'm going to give y'all who are on this call, like access to like a bunch of notes um, from the content AI, if you'd like to see. So just kind of look through like the ways that I provided it feedback. Um, and then if you want to go deeper, I have lots and lots more of that. Um, but it is interesting to see like the things that we kept seeing, like that it, that it wouldn't fix even when we commanded it to fix it and, you know, things like that. Um, it was a fascinating process. Okay. So why do we care for SEO? So the argument is not quality. It is, but it's not, right? For SEO, you can't say the argument is totally just quality. That, well, Chat G, I can write better than Chat GPT. Like at some point, that may not be true. So next, like you got to find a more compelling argument than that. The first is that so far, 
Google favors original content. We are paying very close attention to this, as you can imagine, right? Um, the helpful content update quality scores, AI checkers, this is absolutely what is becoming, it, that's what Google's talking about. Now, very interestingly, though, last April, Google had, what is it called? Uh, buh, buh, buh. Google had original content. Here it is. Yeah, automatically. Okay. So last April, yeah, it was April like 7th or something. They explicitly stated in their terms and conditions that they were against or prohibited automatically generated content. By the summer of last year, they had changed that wording to be automatically generated content intended to manipulate search rankings. Everyone like flipped because it could mean something that they changed it that way, right? So if there is a problem with the way you create content, if it looks like you've just copy and pasted chat GPT, like we can't know for sure what that difference is, but many people think it could mean that at some point Google will be okay with this as long as it's been edited or as long as it's clearly been optimized or as long as it has links or, you know, some of the things that the content AI tool can't do itself. Um, that could be. So there's a couple of resources in here and I would definitely kind of look at that, but basically like AI for content. Okay. AI content for SEO is currently considered cheating by Google. Okay. That's what we think. That's what we're pretty sure it might not be in the future. So it's just one of those things like pay close attention because when Google releases updates, they give us a lot. Of, they don't ever say anything explicitly, of course, because their algorithm is a black box and they don't want to tell you, but there's a lot of hints, right? A lot of clues that you can kind of decode and think, okay, that might mean something um, that they changed the language of that. Um, but at the very least, regardless of whether Google thinks you're gaming the system or not, as far as we can tell, and based on 20 years of the algorithms of evolution, Google always favors original content, okay? And the problem is, and what I said a minute ago, is that content AI is not technically generative in a true sense. It's iterative. It's only iterating inputs, other content, and indexed stuff, okay? It's not technically generating anything that's completely new. Is it combining something in a way that maybe has never been combined that way before? Yes, but as soon as it does that, it can do it again. So even if it's unique the first time you export it, that exact same content could be recreated for other users over and over again. There are only, again, finite. We think of it as vast, but it's finite, and there will be a limit on the number of variations based on certain commands which makes it not original, okay? Pretty important. Um, and then the last is just that, so I think those are two very compelling arguments. If somebody says, should we just use chat GPT for SEO? Well, I would say caution because we know that Google favors original content and this technically does not meet that criteria. And more importantly, currently Google has said it is not going to, it's going to downvote, downgrade, potentially ban, automatically generate a content that manipulates search rankings. So those are two very big cautions that I think are pretty objective, okay? The third, and you've probably seen this in the news, you can't own AI material. So if a business creates, you know, 8,500 articles from ChatGPT and puts them on their website, they don't own any of that content. It's not intellectual property. You can't safeguard it. The legal system has so far been very vehement and like taken a very hard line stance on that. Um, Cause there have been people who have tried to sue over AI generated art. There, there was a guy who tried to create like an AI lawyer and have him be like in a courtroom. And they were like, no humans can practice law and that's it. Um, so this has been, people are trying, right? They're trying all the different ways. Um, but it cannot be intellectual property if it's not a human's intellect. It cannot be copyrighted and it can't really be owned. So somebody could take your entire website, copy and paste it. And there's nothing you can do about it. 
So I think those are three. I think if I were to say like right now today, what are the three reasons I would discourage a company from using content AI for SEO? It would be those three reasons. I think those are the three most compelling reasons. And I think those three reasons are unlikely to change anytime soon. Any questions about? I have some questions, Joy. Sure. So what happens if you like use an AI to like create a shell of something and then you add your own like original content in it and edit it? Would you own the information then? And then would Google still see it as AI generated content? It depends. So the the most robust AI checkers that have been created to date are in the education space like for papers and stuff. Cause you know, that, that guy at Princeton created one. Um, so I think in addition to learning how to use the content AI systems, we're all going to have to start to learn how to use the AI checkers just as much as we use like, and like plagiarism tools. I think there will be a Grammarly plugin for it at some point, probably pretty soon. Um, so I'm not familiar enough with having like scored content for that purpose to know how how much is too much mm -hmm. to leave because what you just described is exactly what people are being recommended to do like use ai to create all the ideas right or an outline or things like that and that saves a ton of time and it's super useful and it's usually pretty accurate um why not right um and so i would say that that seems like a safe bet but it will be important at some point for us to like use those tools ourselves so that we can learn how much do I have to change it? Because mm -hmm. it will, there will be a threshold just like there is for plagiarism. That was going to be my other question about the AI detectors. So like, do they give you suggestions on how to fix the content or think, like say what's wrong with it? So I, I yeah, go ahead. I um, have been using a originality AI, the detector, and it does, because I've been playing around a lot with this, um, it does show you, it'll bring up the score and it will show you the like green passes, red needs to be changed. That still, I think some of it is not 100% accurate and they have a disclaimer it's not 100% accurate but it does visually show you what it's highlighting as AI content and that's originality AI and it's I think it's only like $20 it's super cheap and you get all these credits um, and like one scan you know takes up a certain amount of credits but it's it's cheap and it's a good Wait, because that's what I started using it for because I wanted to experiment with this and see like what was the point that it was becoming, you know, picked up by AI. So yeah, that's the one I've been trialing. <laughs> Where do you create the content originally, typically? So in ChatGBT, I've been doing the outlines and then essentially just really playing around with the prompt, like the prompt input, because that can significantly change <laughs> the outcome. Um, and yeah, essentially editing it to the point where I'm like, can it pass the AI, AI detection test or not? And where's it sort of like picking up? For me personally, it saved a lot of time in terms of outlining mm -hmm. um, and that basic research. It's been a huge <laughs> time saver. <laughs> Um, but yeah, obviously it's important to me that everything, you know, is, I'm not providing clients with anything that's like AI generated yeah. that wouldn't pass that, that scanner. So yeah, but I've found it to be a really helpful tool in the, the building of like the structure of an, of an article. And I think for SEO, you know, like how, kind of how we were looking at, at Surfer, SEO the other day, like those tools kind of do something similar, right? Where they kind of tell you, okay, based on the SERP numbers for this kind of, for this key phrase, here's how you should structure the article. Here's the H2 Exactly. Yeah. All of that. Yeah. I think 
you know, what that wouldn't take into account is the website and some of those considerations of like, what is the website capable of ranking for? What is our linking strategy? Um, you know, some of those factors may be a little bit um, in the works, but I don't see any reason why it can't, it wouldn't be able to do that um, fairly soon. Like when I look at, so we work for a few companies, like we do SEO services, but then we work for a few companies that like in our business engagements that have SEO agencies. And when I look at the outlines they provide, I'm like, a tool could have done this. Mm. Like it's so basic and it's just math. So that's exactly what computational mechanisms are good at. <laughs> it's math. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for weighing in, Alicia. That's helpful. <laughs> I think it'll be, I think Grammarly will have it soon. I think all the plugins that we use, it'll be pretty. Mm. I think it'll be very standard. Yeah. Any other questions on that, Ashley? Nope, that was it. Thanks. Cool. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about, about content. Okay, I, I'm a little bit, I don't know. When I do like, so I use, uh, in Discord, I use an AI art generator called Midjourney. It's fascinating. I've, I have like, and, and that's probably actually what I've learned most about prompts because I'm really visual. So it's really obvious how it responds to a prompt and then what it creates. And then I'm like, oh, I should have also told it this, or I should have, I find that harder to do in written text for some reason. Cause I'm like, I have such strong opinions about how I'm, I, how I would write something that I'm just like, no, this is garbage. Um, but you know, to your point, Alicia, like learning the prompts and I'm sure there will be training programs that we can all take for this. And it, it's going to be, this is going to be a whole field that's dramatically changing how content gets created. And that's not a bad thing, but as of yet, content AI is still a bad writer. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a fine outliner. It's a fine researcher. It's fine at computing, but it's not a great writer. And I have a few reasons for saying that. And I'm going to soapbox you because you're here and you're a rapt audience and you have to listen to me. So <laughs> this is why I think content AI is a bad writer. First, voice and style. So we have done so many projects lately with clients on like brand voice and wanting to stand out in the marketplace and wanting to, to sound different. Okay. And the truth is, you know, brands are becoming more wise to the fact that that matters because their audience is online and everybody pretty much sounds the same. Everyone is an innovative tool that's going to revolutionize and blah, 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 blah. blah. I mean, it, just the jargon is so dramatically intense. So creating content that is truly different requires taking a different subset of vocabulary um, and style and cadence and punctuation and Ital ital italicizing and underlining and like there are so many tiny little micro decisions that a writer makes in order to create a brand voice and a style and so I led in this blog I was like you know thinking like okay what do Faulkner Tony Morrison and Isaac Asimov have in common which are three of my favorite writers if you put those in a computing system you would not find overlap so again, going back to the idea of like, is this good or bad? Okay, their punctuation's all over the place. Their line breaks are all over the place. Their character development's totally different. Their narrative structure, their method of dialogue, like everything about the way they write is extremely different. And so how would you choose? Like there is no right or wrong answer because it's art, right? And so that personality and style factor is tricky for that reason. And then for the second reason, think about it. What any digital tool has to draw from is digital assets. So every book sitting in the library that has not yet been converted to digital is off the table. And nothing that is coming, right? Like all of the future writers who are building these great, beautiful, revolutionary ideas within themselves, right? Like our generation's Faulkner or John O'Kennedy tool or 
Maya Angelou or whatever, like these people exist now, but maybe they haven't written yet. And like that, what they're going to create and put into our world is real and is art and is not something that could ever be created by AI. And so it's very, very important to us to remember that, you know, great artists cultivate this ability to express themselves and it's informed by their childhood and their experiences and their trauma and their joy and all these things that are so distinctly human that yes, what they create could could still be an aggregate of Renaissance and hippies and right they yeah they have referential material too but they put it together in a way that nobody has ever done before why do we care about Banksy why do we care about people who have disrupted the art world or music or writing because it was it was something in the human experience that was put together in a way that's never been done before so yes content AI is fine but it can't do that. And I don't think it ever will be able to. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, the second is break and flow. So one of the hardest things to get as a writer is the gestalt, which means the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Okay, that concept, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. AI can take all the right parts and it can put it together into something. But that something may not be, it may not even make sense. So this is kind of what I was talking about, like the unit structure of what the algorithm, at least in my experience, was able to tackle was really problematic. Like it wouldn't write a good novel because it can't take, it can't do the whole picture of something really well, especially not something big. Um, because it's just very difficult to do. It requires incredible complex thought. Writers understand break and flow really well. Good writers, right? And I mean, my personal writing is obviously very, if you've ever read my actual writing, like I break a lot. Like I'm a big fan of like one-liners. <laughs> like my entire writing is like one line, but that's just my style, right? That's just what I like. Um, and I'm not a particularly great writer, but that's what I like to do. But they know when to do a profound pause. They know when to misspeak on purpose. They know when to manipulate phrasing or turn it or all of the play that a great writer does with the human language is not something that a machine can replicate, right? So they can do all the dots, but you're not getting pointillism out of AI. It's not capable of zooming out and seeing how all the parts contribute to something whole and beautiful. I don't think. And then the last I'll say is, um, and then we'll, we'll have a little discussion at the end, but is colloquialisms and context. So another weakness of content AI, you know, I'm obsessed with speech patterns. I'm obsessed with teeth and how people talk um, and dialects and all that. Um, this was an illustration I used in the blog. Okay. One day I was in a personal development workshop. My dad had taken me there. I was like 10 years old. And the guy was telling a story about how he had a friend whose family owned a chalet 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 he said the word a whole bunch of times right we have this beautiful chalet in the mountains the chalet is our family owned we've it's been in the family for generations right and the guy went up to him and he, at one point and he was you know eager to visit or whatever and had basically said like i'd love to come visit your cabin sometime and he said the guy like vi visibly recoiled was like and he never got an invite right we know like as a work we're, we're laughing because it's so real right like people have very specific words that they emphasize or have value in, and then words that they do not like that mean something. And it's very similar to the idea that like AI can't create art because words don't mean anything to it, right? They're just utilitarian. They're just functional. Um, a good writer has observed humans really well. And you know who I'm going to talk about right now. And it's Fred Armisen, right? If you ever watch the Fred Armisen videos where he goes through, don't laugh at me, Sanders, but he goes through and does all the different dialects of like Texas or Mexico. Like he understands human 
speech patterns and idiosyncrasies to like such a granular level. And great writers do the same thing, right? You understand how people talk. So when you're doing ICP and you're building a persona for a client and saying like, Hey, these are the two groups of people we're talking to, you know, what the difference is and how you'll talk to those two groups. And it's usually very, very minor. The little changes that you make in a value statement or the little change you make in a pain point or a joke, like these are very, very small and very thoughtful decisions that a good writer makes. But at the end of the day, it's what makes writing effective especially in a marketing context. And if we can tell from the clues of Google, great human writing, marketing writing that resonates to an audience that's different from everything else out there is what is going to continue to lead the pack. It's what's going to continue to make websites rank. Um, and the big, you know, ever-growing body of mediocre nothingness won't be as effective. Okay. Um, Oh yeah. And just the point of like, okay, we often would have to catch like hate speech. I mean, I don't know if you've seen some of the Twitter threads of like the one AI, like proposing to the guy, whatever. I mean, it just gets weird. It gets macabre. It gets like dark and depressing because it's the source material. Like there's a lot of weird stuff on the internet and it's really hard to train to filter because words mean many things. And if we know anything about people getting around like the cannabis hashtags on TikTok, people are very creative at restating something that they want to say anyway, but not using the, the no, no word. <laughs> so, you know, the, there could be a huge opportunity here for this to become really problematic over time. I'm sure that there are plans in place for it to not be. Um, but at the very least, what we can know is that like, if we have to train it not to replicate hate speech, it's not capable of like microcultural lingo, right? If we're talking to Philadelphia, we say you all. If we're talking in Pittsburgh, we say yins. How can we teach it that? Like that's such a small, minute colloquialism and it's very regional, but it's very relevant for marketing, right? To create that community feel and to resonate with um, a local audience. Okay, so that's kind of my spiel. I think at the end of the day, it's as good as its input and it's as good as its operator. If you want to use it, like Alicia said, there are absolutely uses for it. You need to understand how it works and you need to um, begin to consider the tools that you are going to learn so you can use it. And I think that's that's really the charge for all of us. Um, it's not coming for our jobs, but it's useful. And we need to consider if we want to use it, how we want to use it, and then make sure that we're continuing to build the moat that our writing is actually creative, that it is actually not just a regurgitation of every other version of something on the internet, that there's enough creativity and infusion of life and thought and uniqueness that there is, <laughs> yeah, there's a huge obvious, they don't need an AI checker. It's very obvious that this was written by a human. Um, not to say that all our clients can't or shouldn't use those and we'll recommend that they do. But um, this is definitely not going to hamstring any of us. And we need to think about how to use it to our advantage. Other experiences. Who's tried it? What have you, what, what have you been surprised by? Or what have you liked about it? Be it chat GPT or open AI or, or what that is the same thing. You know what I mean? Jasper and all the others. I was, my engineers beat me to it. Mm -hmm. So I hadn't really, I hadn't really jumped on the board because I was like, I don't, I don't understand what this thing is. Like, it's too much technology for me. <laughs> I just need a keyboard and somewhere to type. But my engineers, they stopped me like, I don't know, three weeks ago. Dylan, have you used that chat thing yet? Do you, do you use that yet? Do you use it for everything in marketing? I was like, okay, first of all, I have to learn what it is. Second of all, no, <laughs> I'm kind of scared of it. <laughs> But they're using it big time, like to do programming and different coding stuff for the machines. And I thought I was so sick because that saves them an abundance of time when they're like, for them, they need the machine to do one thing. 
mm-hmm. right? They don't need a variation of that one thing. They need it to do that one thing. So if it can write the code or write the script or whatever to do that one thing, that's easy. That's awesome for them. You know, they don't need to worry about whether or not Google's going to ding them for it or <laughs> what, what other issues they might have. So it's kind of neat to see them jumping on board too and using it. Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, since, I mean, Sanders, you and I wrote a lot about AI like a couple of years ago, but just thinking about, okay, time saving is great, but kind of like we're going to talk about on Thursday, like, then what do you do with your time? Like, it's great to save time. So then what skill are you building? What craft are you developing? How are you going deep? Um, because you're not saving time so that you can work a four hour work week, right? Like we want to be productive. We want to think about like, okay, then if this can do all of this, then what could the next era of human communication and creativity look like if it can take care of this like grunt work stuff, right? Then what could we be free to do? For me, at the moment, I've been using it a lot because when it first came out, I like freaked out. I was like, oh my gosh, like this, because all the chat, like all the groups I'm in, everyone's like, oh my God. So (laughs) I've been using it a lot to try and like almost reaffirm my place as a writer to say, yes, I am better than this. (laughs) Um, And really for brand voice, is where like that is what I haven't actually had any clients come to me to ask about it yet which is interesting but one of my biggest for me is the fact that like it cannot do brand voice and it cannot tell stories and so I'm using I'm really working on my skills in that area to separate (laughs) and continue to separate myself um, from chat GPT and using it and it's just fascinating like I'm I I love like playing around with the prompts and like it's it's really it's really fascinating but yes I'm I'm using it to save time and working on what I feel like sets me apart as a writer so which is brand story and voice mm-hmm. I think that's the perfect decision What do you think about it, Sanders? Um, I mean, I, I think as like a general tool, it, it can, like we've been talking about, kind of streamline a lot of different processes. But I remember when I, uh, when it first started kind of like making headlines, I started kind of messing around with it. And like doing just like a bunch of fun prompts and stuff like that. And I forget what it was, what I had put into it, but it came up with something that was just wrong. Like it was, it was, it was a, just misinformation or like a, I don't know what was happening. And I was really kind of confused by it. Um, and then I was listening to this podcast where I think they were interviewing one of the people who were who's on involved with open AI. And the thing that really stuck out to me is like this, these the chat GPT doesn't have a relationship with the truth, the way that we have a relationship with it. It's just kind of almost trying to guess what that next word is going to be or whatever the next phrase is going to be. So you like run into these problems where it, it will just lie. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, and I've kind of like taken that with me kind of moving forward as like, I, I haven't really messed with it as much as I should. I feel like maybe I need to kind of start working on some prompts and experimenting. But yeah, that, that I remember hearing that and I was like, oh, okay. So we could just be getting, we could just be feeding people just, mm-hmm. just lies. Well, that was the whole ad when Google launched, what is Google's called? I suddenly can't remember. But the it had, Bard. Bard. yeah, Bard. It had generated <laughs> like a a news article or whatever, and they used it in the paid ad, and it was wrong. Like the facts in it were wrong. <laughs> so yeah, no, you can't just take it at face value. <laughs> yeah. But that is good, Sanders. And I think, you know, it goes back to what we talked about in book club with bird by bird of like, our job is the truth. As craftspeople, as creative professionals, like our job is to get closer and closer to the truth of human experience, the truth of relationships, communication, needs. And it doesn't have that moral compulsion. Yeah. And like, I think from a, like a, 
uneducated, not maybe not uneducated, but just from an outside perspective, it can seem like it's, oh, it's just doing all the things a human can do. But in reality, like that's not the way that it reaches the results. Like it's a completely different process. Like it's not using the kind of reasoning or just kind of intuitive skills that we all have that we just developed as human beings. Like it just doesn't have that. I, yet, I, I suppose. Yeah. Maybe it'll get more sophisticated. What do you think, Ross? Uh, I mean, the first time you use it is kind of one of those like magic technology moments. Like, I don't know, the first time you use Wi Fi or the first time you went in like a car that could like park itself. It was like one of those moments where you're like, oh, wow. So, um, I don't know. I think there's like a tendency to be very defensive about it which is probably unhealthy because if you go on Twitter, you would believe that like half of knowledge workers are going to be out of the job in like the next three years because of AI. And, you know, when you read that, you're like, Oh no, like this is going to be terrible. And it's easy to get defensive and people ask you about it. But I think because of the, the skills that we've you know talked about, the good writers and more broadly good, like knowledge workers and creative professionals have like being able to develop brand voice, um, you know, having a relationship with the truth, the, the things that we've talked about, you start to realize that, you know, you shouldn't be defensive about it. You should consider it. It's going to be a great technology. It's going to change a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think, you know, we have a responsibility to, to explore it and figure out how we can use it. Um, yeah, I had another thought, but I can't remember now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a little shiny object syndrome about it i think at first but it's important to pragmatically consider like how does this impact strategy going forward and then how can we move into things that are more i mean you think even like three or four years ago we were just like churn i mean we would create 500 blogs a week you know and various clients and this and i mean it's just grunt work and you were like this is mind-numbing so if we don't have to do that which we don't anymore do that anyway but yeah I think that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. What do you think, Cass? Have you played around in it at all? Or what do you, see, how do you see this being? I mean, you're in a tech business. Yeah, I haven't played around with it, but my relationship with AI has, it has been with tech. So like how it can um, enhance like genetics and farming and, and stuff like that. Um, I think with communication and how AI affects it I think it's just one small like portion of the of a big picture of how AI is affecting everything um even just thinking about uh how it'll affect music if a songwriter just like plugs it into um some AI thing and like how songs will transition and change over time um yeah it's everywhere. I don't know. I think you're right that you can't really escape it. So. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's just an invitation to do deeper work. And it's interesting. I'll, I'll end with this, but I'm reading. Well, I know you all probably know. Okay, I'm reading this. I'm obsessed with it. I know I talk about it every day. Okay. <laughs> this is like the best, but we're reading this. All of you who work with me, <laughs> uh, this is our next book club book. And we have to go real slow because it's dense, but he was talking today about how, um, you know, there are basically three domains of, of human thought, science, ethics, and art, and how we live in this kind of day and age where science has become the dominating force where most of what we do, basically science is the ultimate authority. If it can't be explained by natural law, it doesn't exist. And art and ethics have kind of been subsumed in Western culture anyway, by the dominance of science and just questioning whether that's helpful, holistic, right? And I think this could be kind of almost in a very paradoxical way, like the the advent of really prevalent technologies that support human function that kind of decrease some of the effort we have to put in could free us up to kind of revisit or recall as a more broadly as a culture and in our businesses and all of that the art and the ethics and that could be a an incredibly positive and world-changing outcome of AI 
It has nothing to do with SEO. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Anything else? But but some of this had to do with SEO. <laughs> that counts, right? All right. I'll send you whatever I showed you. And then if you want extra notes and stuff like that, feel free to let me know and I'll spam you with all kinds of things. All right. Next week, Thanks we're talking joy. about topic clusters. So that'll be fun and festive. Have a good night. <laughs> festive. Good night, Thanks, Joy. Talk Bye. soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.